All right, welcome back. Um, we are now in our Neurologic Emergency Department Command Center session. Um, and with me, as you've already seen, it did an awesome job on our last uh, session, uh, Dr. Mandy Binning and Dr. Karen Greenberg. Um, so again, we got some great questions uh, throughout the day and especially the last session. So, you know, keep them coming and, and don't be afraid to ask questions because these sessions are only as good as the interaction. And don't be afraid to ask challenging questions or any specific question whatsoever. And we'll honor, honor, eh, answer them the best we can. Um, so really what we wanted to do, um, and some of you out there may have seen these talks before, particularly, I mean, this is, I guess, our 12th neuroscience conference, if you can believe it, um, from going back to Princeton and then the GNI uh, sixth. So um, many of you have probably seen us and heard us talk about the neurologic emergency room. And we just wanted to really, you know, talk about the genesis of it and, you know, where we started and where we are now and where we hope this goes. Um, so really um, over, uh, God, it was, it's 12 years now. Um, you know, we, we, all of us, and I, I think everybody out there that takes these calls from ERs, and no matter what type of acute care setting you're in, and as an ER doctor, you know it, there's always this big disconnect um, where we're sitting on the other end and expecting that the ER doctors know every single thing about MS and you know all the things that a neurologist knows, a neurosurgeon knows, um, but we don't see what you guys see. And you know, what was really, I, I think is vascular neurosurgeons, right? Yeah. Playing Monday morning quarterback. Exactly. Oh my God, it was a headache and you missed it. How yeah. did you miss this? You know, well, how many headaches a day do you guys see that come through the ER, right? Oh, it's one of our most common complaints. Right, which, you know, as, as for us, we never really see what you guys- Every headache is an aneurysm. Exactly right. And then the one that is an aneurysm yeah. that like there's an hour delay where, so, you know, we, we um, found some great people out there who are really good at this. Uh, you know, Mike D'Ambrosio back, way back in the day, and then Karen, who was, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, joined us uh, early on. And then we built the neurologic emergency room. And it was really based on having, a, again, the GNI philosophy of department lists where we're all one, you know, that you guys have a direct uh, ability to call us directly. We talk about patients. Um, and it really started off with stroke, right? I mean, the, the pre-hospital stroke alert um, where, um, you know, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the, what we affectionately call the stroke bus. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a big trend right now um, of having a stroke ambulance. And if you really, you know, dig down into that data, um, it doesn't make sense. Right. Especially in this region, it doesn't make sense. And right. I think that, you know, where I'm from in rural Wyoming, where your nearest stroke center is maybe a two or three hour yes. drive away. Exactly. Having a bus where you can scan someone and give them the treatment and the ambulance, that makes perfect sense. But here you can throw a rock and get to a primary stroke center. So you're really wasting time in the field, scanning, you know, getting the read while you're in the ambulance. And you yeah. could already be in an emergency department, you know, for us, a neurological emergency department. Yeah. And money. Uh, exactly. as well. But yeah, I think when I speak, and we just actually talked about this at ASLS, our advanced stroke life support class last week that we're now educating. And, you know, in my opinion, so the fastest door to needle time now that I've had to treat a patient is 12 minutes. Yeah. Where, where else do you see that? I mean and by the time the, so the way that the stroke buses work or the mobile stroke units, first the EMTs go. Then they call for the stroke right. ambulance. That's right. And a lot of people don't realize that you have to stop the ambulance to get the head CT. Yep. It can't be moving. And you have to, to and it has images. to be like stable. They put it on these like props. It's exactly yeah. right. So just bring the patient to our stone throw away <laughs> stroke center and I'll get you TPA in 12 minutes. That's, you know, Karen, that's an excellent point. So actually let's go through those steps because, you know, it, it brings up a great point is that it's not like, oh, there's a stroke and this bus comes with a whole team of people and the CAT scan's done and we're giving IVTPA. So, I mean, if that's my mom, my dad, and I've got somebody, you know, the EMS squads, which are phenomenal. I mean, they're, they're like just phenomenal, can get them right to your doorstep where, I mean, 90% of the time you guys are sitting waiting for these patients at the doorstep and yeah. escorting them to the CAT scan. 95%, unless I'm tied up with another acute stroke And patient. somebody else is there, right? Getting them to the CAT scan. I'm literally standing at the entrance waiting for the EMTs. And if I'm not, they know where to find me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think this all started, we realized this 12 or however, 10 years ago with the neurological emer neurologic emergency department, when EMS called ahead, 
um, they were accurate in their diagnosis 80% of the time. If not more, yeah. yeah. And so just that heads up, hey, we're coming, we, we have a stroke, this person, you know, last seen well within one hour, that totally obviates the need for a stroke bus. Absolutely. And, and the time of getting the CAT scan, getting it done appropriately, getting it to the center, having somebody reading it, making a decision, it just doesn't make sense. And um, so I think, you know, it's, it's another thing of just, you know, to your point, you know, EMS is, um, I think, one of the most under uh, appreciated, you know, now with COVID, I think people are getting a better appreciation, but, you know, especially for what we do and what you do, you know, EMS, you know, they're the most critical piece of what we do. Um, and so to br bring them into that and have them come and be part of that team and that flow is great. So that was really the genesis. And then, you know, we started to, as we developed it, it became seizures, it became, um, uh, um, you know, subarachnoid hemorrhages, worst headache of your life. You know, again, I think a lot of people for the hospital administrators that, that, that are out there, um, which this wasn't our original goal, but we ended up seeing, and I think you published that paper, Mandy, um, early on, is looking at the triage process of yes. low back pain coming in. I mean, how, headaches, how many low back pains do you see? Uh, that's probably our second most common. <laughs> right. And, but here's what happens financially. Patient comes in with low back pain, right? Neurosurgeon has zero interest or spine surgeon unless they have MRIs and all this other stuff done. You're doing a million different things. Getting an MRI scheduled for, it's not going to happen. So what happens? We're going to admit the patient. They end up on medicine service up on the floor. Then usually neurology or somebody will get consulted for the back pain or something. I mean, three days goes on. Whereas, you know, the way this process works, Karen and her team, right? You're seeing the patient. You don't even ask us. Like when we get a call from you, first of all, half the time, we probably don't even know about it exactly. because they're getting, they'll, you'll see something and that patient goes home with an appointment, you know, within a week. And we've already proven that with the TIA clinic, which we haven't talked about, right. um, to be able to get patients in the loop. But if they do have something serious, we're catching it. It's a direct call to the, to the surgeons. They're getting admitted on our service. They're going to the OR, but you know, epilepsy, um, spine, and then you want trauma. to talk a little bit about, <laughs> see, we're on the same page, talk a little <laughs> bit about trauma and the experience, and we won't name centers or anything, it's, there's nothing bad about the center, but that, um, how shocking it is, how many traumas, um, yeah. where everybody's focused on trauma, and they're coming in as trauma, <laughs> but there's really something else going on. Talk about the experience. Yeah, the, the, the... yeah this was actually something that was really eye-opening for me, uh, that, you know, patients who are just found down are automatically called traumas, mm -hmm. whether they're on blood thinners or not, because they're found down with an altered mental status. And you know, one of the nice things about ATLS is that it has a very clear algorithm of how you go down, but everybody gets so locked in blinders to trauma. And I think we know in ER that once you have blinders on, that will lead you down the path of darkness, that you really have to have a wide <laughs> differential of what might be going on. So these patients who had some type of neurological deficit and the plain head CT doesn't show a skull fracture or a traumatic brain injury, and it just says, okay, well, maybe we'll admit them for concussion yep. or admit them to medicine for syncope. Or the person who was in a car accident, but maybe the accident was because of a stroke or they seized or, or seizure. Something. Yeah. Right. And uh, so something actually that we got really high praise for with our mock survey, as mm -hmm. we uh, look to become comprehensive any day now, which I guess we can talk <laughs> about that too. You know, we really got praised for how we're addressing the traumas and the neuro ED physician goes to every trauma. And we are there, now we have our blinders on just for the neuro exam. Because let me tell you, 20 people respond to these traumas of which you need a handful. And what's really nice is like most things, you meet some resistance at first, but it's really come full circle where Dr. Habre might come up to me and say, hey, Karen, can you come look at this patient specifically for a neurological complaint? Mm -hmm. And the, the teamwork, because at the end of the day, it's not about us or our egos, it's about the patient right. and getting the patient the care that they need. And if that's you, having to come in in the middle of the night for a thrombectomy because it's not a trauma, it's a stroke, or it's me weighing in, I think we should do a CTP, CTA of the head and the neck on this trauma patient while we're looking for other injuries. Yeah. 
it's it's really been a great asset. Yeah, and it brings back what we talked about this morning, this departmentless approach where everybody comes in and, you know, doing a, a, a two minute survey of the patient to make sure and say, something's not right here. They're not moving the right side as well as the left. That's like yes. a lateralizing symptom. You know, let's just, you know, while you're doing your survey for trauma, add the head so we can look. And it, it's, it's such a simple thing. You know, I mean, when you, it's amazing when you talk to people who aren't involved in healthcare and they're like, well, wait, that doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. And everybody out there who works at a hospital knows it doesn't. I mean, everybody's in their silos and that's, that's where balls get dropped. Things get missed. Um, you know, I was going to say, I think even if you, this kind of goes back to the genesis of the neurological emergency department, like just look, researching for papers and everything, it seems like emergency department physicians, most of the time they don't have any sort of neuro specific rotations during their residency. So neuro is kind of a black box when it comes to emergency medicine. You have pediatric, geriatric emergency departments, but neuro is sort of this thing that, oh, I, what do I do with this? And I I think that goes to your training and um, how you guys are so specialized to really focus on neurological emergencies. Yeah. So two things with that. Uh, number one, you mentioned Dr. Mike D'Ambrogio, mm -hmm. who's been my mentor <laughs> since I was a resident. And Mike, if you're out there. <laughs> I won't tell you how long ago that was, though. Uh, and so we were very lucky at my program in South Jersey that Mike was a neurologist who grandfathered into emergency medicine. So we were very lucky that whenever you either worked with him or had conference, you were constantly learning about neuro. But the other piece of it is I really feel like as emergency medicine physicians, we've let neuro get away from us because of the tele neuro piece. Yeah. And even some of the comprehensive centers around here you know, if you train at a comprehensive center, you call a stroke alert, the stroke team comes down, which is not the ER, and you don't even know what imaging they're ordering. Did they give all to place? What happened next? How do you manage blood pressure? How do you vet out a mimic versus a stroke? Yeah, and sometimes there's a disconnect where the you know, stroke team's coming down saying give yeah. all to place, but the blood pressure management's left up to the emergency <laughs> department who doesn't know what's going on. Yep. Yeah. And the interventionist at some places yeah. is the third person down the road yeah. and all this is going on. And yeah, I mean, and it's a good point about the education because that was, you know, the genesis, the start of this was, uh, I mean, way back when I, I mean, you want, you guys don't want to get into the game of aging yourself. <laughs> I mean, when, when Ken Lieben and I were at, at Jefferson way back, we would talk to Mike and he was an ER doctor and he'd be like, yeah, I got a lady down here. I think she's got an eye. I know it looks like I'm working up for him. I'm like, wait, is this a neurologist? He's like, oh, I'm an ER. And we just started, you know, every time he was on, it was like, he was just, you know, he was a neurologist. To your point, he was trained in neurology. And that's where we kind of clicked. We're like, you know, wouldn't it be awesome if like every ER doc had this? And you did that research of the, uh, I think there's something like 97 training programs in the U.S. for emergency medicine. And I don't know the exact number, but I think the total throughout entire residency, it was something like in a total of like 12 hours, hours. of hours of dedicated neurodidactic time. So think about that. So it's learning on the job right. to your point, telemedicine came along and before telemedicine, um, you know, a lot of neurosurgeons, yes, I'm saying it, or, you know, are really <laughs> don't do anything. You know what I mean? Just so you call me if anything neuro comes up and then there's a disconnect. Yeah. So I think that this, um, you know, this, this model, I think we prove works. It's also, you know, it's a little insulting to me that when I was training, you know, prior to coming on board with you guys, where I trained somewhere, somebody comes in with a dense right hemiparesis and a gaze to the left and they can't speak to me. And it happened an hour ago and there's no obvious contraindications. It really bothered me that I had to call a teleneurologist, yeah. wait for them to come on the screen, verify everything that I've already done. And, and don't get me wrong, I absolutely need you guys for some of the crazy cases that I just showed in the talk yeah. before here. You know, somebody had an nephrectomy two days ago. What do you, l let's brainstorm about this. Right. But if it's straightforward, why do I need a neurologist to say, treat that patient with all the place? Or anybody, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, the, the, you know, for everybody listening, you know, the model, the tradition, in most places, I would say 90% of the places, there's a stroke team, which is usually like stroke neurologist. And there's this triage of steps of phone calls. Yes. And so when as interventionalists, right, you and I are getting called in that model, 
we're the last people to even know about this. <laughs> yeah. So meanwhile, when it's a direct call to the mm -hmm. person who's boots on the ground, seeing the patient, making decisions, you, we're on the other end. Oh, got it, Karen. All right, I'm getting on packs. Ooh, this looks like a whole, um, exactly. you know, this looks like a whole hemispheric thing. You know what? Go ahead and give the IVTPA a click. Hey team, come on in, get to That's the angio exactly. suite. With How it. much time do you save? With the target stroke guidelines now as well, you know, 60 minutes for transfers and 90 minutes for patients in our ER, it has to be that way. You can't yeah. have all these layers yeah. or we'll never meet those times. And I think we have a question. Um, yeah, one question here. Working as a medic and when we call to talk to the medical command doctor on duty, it seems they automatically make patients traumas and don't listen to the medics. What can they say to get them to move more in their logic? All right. Well, I'm going to try to keep this PG. So yeah. um, offline, whoever that is, I'll connect with you and tell you exactly what to say. So, you know, again, we're not, we're not, you know, we're not pandering here. I mean, we, I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, Mandy's been doing this for, for, you know, uh, 12 years, 13 years. You've been, we, we have, we know uh, uh, what you guys do and we, I, I can't tell you how much we, you know, um, respect what you do, but not just respect. We know you guys are on the front line and the, the bottom line is your goal is to protect that patient. Um, and you're right. That's exactly what happens. Almost yeah. everything comes in as a trauma alert. And a lot of times they're not traumas and it's, mm -hmm. it's delaying things. It's misdiagnosed. So when I would say to answer your question is, um, you know, we, you know, we want you guys to be part of the process, come in and, and say something, speak up. We're going to listen to you. You guys are in the field. You know what's going on. You talk to the families. You saw the environment. You have a better history than anybody, and say, "Hey, guys, this is a stroke. I think this yeah. is a stroke. Speak up." And and use the use the stroke language instead of the trauma language. It right. kind of puts the that in their head and gets them set up for a stroke alert when they're anticipating receiving the patient. So their race score is X or their men's score, whatever scale that you use with your squad. I would start using, if you're pretty sure it's neuro and not a trauma, just use that language instead of the trauma language. So the trauma is sort of in the background. Yeah. yeah, and I'll tell you, the first thing I look at is the EMS report Yeah. because that's kind of where all the clues are and the real questions. I mean, you know, bottom line is, look at a lot of the misses have been, you know, somebody's waking up in the middle of the night, somebody's found on the ground and their spouse sees them lying there. That's not a trauma. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they may have fractured something, but they're falling for something else. So that's a great question. There's another question I, I, I see right up here about um, why doesn't everyone have a neurologic emergency room? And um, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I can tell you, I tried doing it at Jefferson um, mm -hmm. and it's not a dig on Jefferson, just in any academic center, there's too many politics, you know? It's, well, who's gonna control this? Who's gonna do that? Who's gonna do this? Um, you know, the three of us have scars on our bodies from the, the battles <laughs> we fought, but now everybody gets it and understands it. Um, I don't know, but I do think other places are doing it now. I think Yale yeah. um, is now starting to do it. Um, uh, I think it's the future. I, I, I can't imagine. We have pediatric ERs. Mm -hmm. We have tra you know, trauma, obviously. There's geriatric ERs. Yeah. Langone, NYU is poison. I mean, it's a toxicology ER that if, you're, if you have a poisoning. So I think it's coming. I um, also think that there's a lack of understanding of how much neuro actually comes into the emergency department every day. And so they look at it from a financial standpoint, like how can we dedicate one physician to just, you know, see they, in their mind, it's five patients a day or something, but you can attest to this. I mean, back pain, headache, trauma, stroke, Mm -hmm. you're busy all day long and it's yes. all fits in the realm of neuro, right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, to, to go along with that, that's why you have to be an ER doctor, right? So like, why yeah. am I on the panel and not one of our neurologists? Right. And the reason is, is when you walk into a room that's dizzy, that might, that patient, this has happened to me, that patient will be in VTAC. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can do real dizzy that's neuro, but I can also take care of VTAC that's cardio. Right. I'll walk into dizzy and the pressure's 70 over 40. That's a GI bleed that now needs to be managed. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's also a big piece of it. But we'll see every headache, every seat, and things come in themes. <laughs> so like all day long, I'll see headache. All day long, I'll see seizure. Seizures will keep us in business, like car accidents will keep you guys in business with patients not taking their medicines. Mm -hmm. We'll see the back pains. We'll see the syncopes. We'll see the altered mental status. Um, I usually go see all the fall patients. 
Uh, and then of course we're doing the strokes and we're doing your guys, you know, post-op patients that need to come in as well. you right. Yeah. I was just going to go into that, that, that the other piece of this, which again, wasn't something that it just happened to be another, you know, icing on the cake yes. was that, you know, um, our chest pain is, uh, you know, and the neurologists and neurosurgeons, all of us, you, you have a patient and something go, you know, with neuro, you know, whether they're having a seizure, whether they have another headache again, and they think, oh my God, I have a, an aneurysm. Is this, you know, I know I have an aneurysm. Is this bleeding? They come to the ER and what do they, ha- what do they do? They take a number, they get put in the back. It's, it's a nightmare for them. Whereas how many times, like right now, one of our patients calls with something, head to the neurologic emergency mm-hmm. room, you know, you and your team are there, you know, the patient, you're directly speaking nine times out of 10 with the actual physician who's, yep. who's the doctor of that patient. Where, what other world does that happen in? Um, and that patient's another one. It, it's, it, it's delay in care. Um, a lot of times you're getting admitted for no reason because people don't, re- you know, there's no way you're going to know all the yeah. details of the history. Unnecessary imaging. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, and the patients love it because they're, they say, I'm here to see Dr. Greenberg. You know, they know. Right. Uh, you know, this patient's being sent over to rule out a pseudo aneurysm or whatever it is, you know, post-op infection, you know, they know uh, that they're going to come straight back and who they're going to say. Yeah. And it's, I mean, how often is the ER doctor part of that team? I mean, there are people who put <laughs> Facebook stuff on about, you know, their experience in the neuro ED and how, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's just an ER yeah. is a scary place. It's a high acuity place. It's not a personal uh, experience at all. I think that this makes it that much more so. Um, and again, we're not we're not trying to plug anything here. This is, this is we're talking about the concept of this, and and actually, we're sharing this because we hope everybody yeah. does it. It's the right thing to do for patients. I hope all the yeah. academic centers do it. I hope Mainline does it. I hope you know that's not a problem. Um, and I think it also uh, lends itself to the other. Um, staff in the emergency department sort of subspecializing. You get nurses who are like, I want to be in the neuro ED. Yeah. I love yeah. taking care of neuro patients. So the other day, that patient who you said had the dye allergy, the CT tech was like, oh, I know that. I'm going to put it down in our log. That way I know it's in our log. Yeah. Even though you put it as an allergy, we'll make sure she never gets contrast again. I mean, it's a whole team approach where everybody gets really into the neuro patients. And if I could just piggyback off of that for just a minute, uh, one of the cases that I took care of two weeks ago, because I think what you're highlighting is that it's not just about the three of us that are sitting up here. It's the total team effort and how we certainly can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, credit to Crozier and for buying into this concept. And so what happened was it was a patient who came from the through the front, which we already know puts us behind the eight ball as opposed to coming in by EMS. We already talked about that. And he was very savvy. He said that he has a history of hemiplegic migraines. He actually said that to me. Patients don't say that they all usually. Say that, don't they? <laughs> no, no. I, I should have been like, can you spell hemiplegic? <laughs> and uh, he also told me that he has a known aneurysm that hasn't been fixed. Hmm. So this isn't really a patient that I'm excited about giving all to place to because number one, you know, we talked about if you give it to a stroke mimic, the patients will do okay. But if you don't need it, you don't want to get it. And, you know, an unsecured aneurysm that he's saying is five millimeters is a little anxiety provoking as well. And I said to him, so if you have hemiplegic migraines, what's different? And what's different is it's persisting longer and it's worse than usual. So how do you know that this isn't the one time that it's a stroke? Right. And me and my team, we went out, we brought a stretcher to him in the waiting room. We brought him back into a room, which if you come in by ambulance, we don't have to do, but we have to get an IV and blood work in him. We went straight to CT. We got CTP, CTA. I called MRI from the CT control room. So number one, CT is buying into what we need to do. The nurses are buying into what we need to do. I said to the MRI tech, I want this guy to come straight from CT to MRI. I need DWI images right away. And if they're negative, we're good. One of our medics in the ER volunteered to take the patient down to MRI. And when the radiologist called me with the CT of the head, I said to her, I need you to look at these DWI images in real time. So this gentleman got a CTP, CTA, MRI, and the results all within 30 minutes. Yeah. It was negative for stroke. So yeah. now we're not going to expose him to all to place. Or admit him or do. Yeah, you he know. went home. Yeah. And, and he went home. After yeah. All I mean, where, where else does that happen? And, 
you know, to, to that point, Manny, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the TIA play. Um, so there's a couple things that in this platform that we can do that you'd never be able to do outside of an OED. And, and you know, one is the nine hour IVTPA. So, I mean, currently GNI is the only center that I know of in the country that's giving IVTPA after four and a half hours based on really good data and best care practice. And then a TIA clinic, meaning that when a patient comes in with a TIA, they go home that day after they go through a very rigorous um, getting an MRI, which yes. you know our colleagues in radiology have been fantastic. And more importantly, that you know getting set up that they're being seen immediately as an outpatient. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about that process? So you know, in most places, somebody comes in with a TIA. You're worried. Your number one concern is that they're going to go out and have another event, maybe with permanent symptoms, before you can actually work them up for why they had the TIA in the first place. So. Most of these patients get admitted to the hospital or at the very least OBS for 24 hours so you can do the, the TIA slash stroke workup. But most of these patients, if they're low risk, don't have to be admitted. And so we do risk stratification with an MRI. If the MRI is negative for stroke, then it's literally a phone call to get set up within 24 hours to see neurology, cardiology. We send them home on best medical management. And we've had really good success with this and you know, saving a hospital admission all, yes. as well. Yeah, so. yeah. It, and that's a game changer. I mean, that's, we, you know, again, it's been done for chest pain, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so chest pain yes. clinics, why aren't we doing it for, you know, oh, it's the brain. It could, you know, it's, it, it's no different. You can still have a massive heart attack or a massive stroke. They're both bad, but there's ways to do it without, throw, you know, doing a shotgun approach. Um, so it's really, you know, that type of, of you know, you start off with one concept of something yeah. and then it, it, it grows out into something, yeah. you know, much bigger with lots of different tentacles to it. Um, and so, you know, as we've expanded um, the, you know, and, and, and again, many of the people who are joining us are um, from our partner hospitals and, and even outside hospitals. Um, you know, we want to incorporate everybody into this, this yeah. ecosystem. And so what we, we started was a command center. So we, we finally said, um, you know, so when we're on call and, you know, my colleagues are on call, we're get. I mean, you know, um, I always say the best gauge is talk to our spouses, um, <laughs> you know, probably every 15 to 20 minutes, um, you're getting a phone call. Um, and most of the phone calls are, um, I'll give you an example of one. Um, and, and I'm sure you, you're going to outdo me on one. Um, <laughs> I got a lady here in the emergency <laughs> room. Uh, yeah, she's coming over from, um, Nursing home X, uh, she's 92, she's had a previous stroke, she has uh, dementia, and her right arm doesn't really move, but somebody thought that, you know, <laughs> it was moving less than before. I mean, I, you can't make this up. And she has a glass eye. And she, exactly. So, I mean, these are real calls, and it's, and I get it, like the emergency room doc, especially depending on what their experience is, but it's not efficient. It's not efficient, it's not, but by the same token, we don't want to miss something. Right. So we're, our calls that we are worried about is I got a lady here with a blown pupil. She had the yeah. worst headache of her life and we're triaging stuff or we're in an operating room or we're in the ICU putting a ventriculostomy in. <laughs> so again, getting back to the idea that you guys aren't just triage people, you know, that your actual critical care med, you know, you have all these de expertise. We started to open up um, the neuro ED to the command center. So all the patients that are stroke alerts, they immediately go into Karen and her team yeah. And they're there. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're taking care of acute patients in the hospital. They have all the resources there. They're connected to everybody. Our incredible PAs are there. There's always, you know, one or two there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we're always, we're either there or, you know, uh, a, yeah. a two second phone call away. And that's a concept that was, um, you know, it, it, again, it kind of sounds like common sense, but but to be able to get that through. Well, and it circles back to your point. You were <laughs> always kind of uh, insulted when you couldn't make the decision to give Alta Place because you had to call teleneurology. Well, now you are the teledoc. Yeah. You're the yeah. one. You're the one making the decision. Careful what you wish for. for. That's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 But it's it's the, the, once you start doing that. Um, you really can't go back. I mean, you really, you, you start to see that and you understand what a difference it makes. I mean, cause you know, people think we're gluttons. We don't take all these calls because we're trying to be, pat. you know, like, oh, look, I just want to take these calls and go, it, it makes a big difference. And, yeah. um, I, and I want to really clarify something just so we don't get beat up down the road. 
in no way, shape, or form are we disparaging, you know, stroke neurology or that neurologists are useless. I mean, if, if anything, you look at our biggest piece of GNI is, is our neurology uh, brothers and sisters. The point is, if you talk to the, you know, what stroke neurology was 10 years ago, we didn't have all these different pathways. We didn't have these surgical treatments. We didn't have, it was diagnose a stroke, you know, do prevention and get them to the floor to stabilize them. You know, now it's a time sensitive disease. Exactly. And most, if not all neurologists, uh, Stan Naden, who just did the, uh, who's our, one of our fellows and a phenomenal neurologist, stroke neurologist, you're either going into critical care, right? Where you're there taking care of patients or you're doing intervention um, uh, yourselves. The days of being on stroke call, it's a waste of time. And what happens at most centers, even the academic centers, actually mostly the academic centers, you know who's <laughs> taking stroke call? The movement disorder neurologist, yeah. mm. the cognitive neurologist, the neuromuscular neurologist. So, so think about that. You've got a cognitive neurologist who spent their lives in fellowships treating cognitive you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, and they're being forced to take stroke call for a manpower issue. So that's the front line. You know, that's like putting, you know, us on, you know, peds call for general peds in an ER. Yeah. It, it, it's a disconnect where the patient gets hurt. Yeah, no, if anything, what we're trying to do is we're trying to actually help the neurology shortage, right. which, uh, you know, we've submitted an abstract to International Stroke Conference that talks exactly about this. There's a huge shortage of neurologists across the country. And so we're actually trying to help our colleagues by saying, hey, you know, we kind of call ourselves the stroke champions of the ER. You know, we feel comfortable with stroke. We have extra training in stroke. And then that leads into when we take these calls from the emergency department, now I'm talking to my colleagues, yep. you know? So sometimes I'm sitting side by side with them in the neuro ED and other times they're calling me from one of the spokes and they say, you know, oh, hey, Karen, it's so-and-so, this is what I have. And right. it's more, you know, a peer conversation yeah. that we're having as well. And I also think that um, we're, we're getting there, but we're not quite there with the culture shift of yeah. TPA is mm. safe. We want to give it every possible time we can. We don't want to make excuses not to give it. So I think having a, a colleague who is an emergency department physician gives TPA, it sort of, again, pushes the notion that emergency department physicians can make these decisions and they always have backup if they need it or if they have questions, but we really want them to be getting the, the medication and quickly and not, not be adding additional time by, you know, yeah. teleneurology and things like that. And so. then what we also figured out was uh, a lot of times you guys, uh, if you have the phone, you might say, you know, go for TPA. What we were realizing is that some providers didn't know how to calculate the dose. They didn't know what blood blood pressure parameter should be less than 185 <laughs> over 110 from last talk. Um, so things that maybe we were taking for granted, like, Yes, that patient's a TPA candidate, but we actually uh, can go through the details with them a little bit more, make recommendations and uh, make suggestions. Yeah, and that's a great you know, polling question out there for people. I mean, what, what percentage of ERs would you guys think um, nationally um, are still ER physicians not comfortable giving you TPA, that they, they need some type of, and, and to your point, it, it's not an intelligence issue. It's not a, you know, a lot of these folks are in ERs where they don't have support yeah. and it's not something they're doing all the time. And, and there's, you know, God forbid something doesn't happen. Like you guys have, you know, your, your last talk, you know, there, there's, there's nobody there, but I, I mean, what is your guess on, I mean, there's is two it, answers. Yeah. So number one, neurology and neurosurgery, 100% believes in all the place for treating stroke patients. ER, so. <laughs> there's about 30% of ER physicians across the country that think that we're doing more harm than good. And we'll right? look for any reason possible not to give it. Oh, the patient's <laughs> improving. Oh, the patient's blood pressure is too high. I'm not even going to try. But do you think that's they don't believe in it or it's just kind of, I don't want to take the risk, the risk because I'm, yeah. yeah. They think it does more harm than good. Yeah, because that's what the, the original. Uh, the flip side of it to answer your question is I would say 90%, if not more, of emergency departments across the country are relying on neurology or neurosurgeon because we've created this stan standard of care that you need to talk to a specialist yeah. before making a decision on your own. Yeah. It gets definitely more 
that they're consulting specialty than pulling the trigger on their own. Yeah, and I think from our experience, and again, you know, we have some of the best ER doctors at our partner hospitals where, um, you know, I can think of going way back, like 10 years ago, Nazareth Hospital. I mean, those ER docs, if you're out there, you know, uh, shout out, I mean, they're like, mm-hmm. they're Jedi. I mean, way <laughs> before they were, we would get the call and they're like, yeah, I'm giving IV TPA, here's the things. And, and you know, they knew, and I think the reason that change occurs because they knew we had their back. Exactly. They knew that we would, um, you know, the criteria are the criteria. It's not like, you know, there's always a gray zone and that's that's what the, you have to have a team. I wouldn't want to just be by myself with no, not talking to anybody, no backup right. that, oh, well, Jesus, this guy's blowing a pupil. Who do I call? And, you know, calling a transfer center to yeah. say, I got a really sick patient and, you know, CAT scan just shows blood. Um, I think that, I think that it will, hopefully we'll see that change, but I think, I think we feel as, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, it's our job to make sure that the ER doctor feels really comfortable with that. They know we have their back. That they know that we're on the same team, that we can work their things. They can call anytime. Um, and also I think to that point, our telemedicine, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we made a prediction. So we have our own telemedicine service, which is, I mean, if I, anybody talks about telemedicine as being cutting edge in the ER again, I'm going to blow my brains out Um, because it's not cutting edge. I mean, it's, it's a way it's helpful sometimes, but when we rolled it out, you would see, and if you plot it out, which we should actually do, because it's a great paper, you plot it out, people were using it, then it did this. And now it's almost non-existent because they know, Oh, Hey, Hey, Dr. Benning, how you doing? It's Joe. And, and yeah, I got another lady here. They don't need to get on that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's kind of like a whoopee and you get weaned <laughs> off of it and, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, I, I know Dr. Fez and we've had good conversations and we, he trusts my judgment and uh, I know if something happens, I give him a call right back. And so we, be, we build these relationships that, um, that help sort of empower them to do what they know is right in the first place. Yeah, just to be clear, so you guys are talking about doing a video consult yeah, yep. versus just a telephone, telephone right. consult. Exactly. And yeah. so how everybody kind of wanted the video at first, but with that comfort level and the GNI way uh, that we've, you know, pretty much transitioned to mostly being able to do it over the phone right. because of that rapport. Yeah, because the video part of it actually, uh, I think if anything, it kind of delays things, but it, it's yeah. good to have as a backup. I think we have a couple questions. And you can show the slides. Yes, uh, question. How effective is TPA in stroke, even with multiple arteries uh, with stenosis, especially the major arteries? Is it still safe to undergo thrombectomy if major blood vessels bilaterally are 80 to 90 percent stenosis? So um, I guess I'll just start by saying there are two separate issues when the risk is not necessarily related you know, stenosis doesn't make TPA riskier. Um, TPA is a thrombolytic. So if you have a stenosis that has a thrombus because you have stagnant flow, the TPA can address that, um, but it's not going to address the stenosis itself. And so whether, say it's, a, say it's a patient who has a stroke because of carotid stenosis, and even if they have bilateral carotid stenosis, you can give them all to place, but ultimately they're going to need the endarterectomy or the carotid stent. But the risk doesn't change because the stenosis exists. And I think also what we've, uh, and I think you both of you have said it, that, you know, give IV TPA. I mean, if yeah. it's even remote, the, the exception is to give it because, you know, it helps even, it's a temporizing measure with, uh, and there's some data out there that says even doing a thrombectomy, it softens the clot. A lot of times mm-hmm. it'll, it'll help with the patient's uh, um, small vessel collateral. So, um, you know, IV TPA is always a, fr- I mean, I think of it and I would say it's like oxygen, you know, it's, it's almost like a stabilizing, again, as long as there's no contraindications, as long as we're fitting within the guidelines. Yeah, we say uh, all to place first, because the other piece of it is, you know, we keep talking about stroke and heart attack, whereas every patient with a heart attack goes to the cath lab, 15 to 20% of stroke patients can actually benefit from your intervention. Mm -hmm. So that means that 80 to 85% of the strokes that we're seeing in the ER are actually not candidates for intervention because they don't have a large vessel occlusion. Mm -hmm. They have small vessel disease or they just have a lacunar infarct in an unlucky place. So you always wanna think all to place first. If you hang your hat on the intervention piece, that's only 15 to 20% of stroke patients. That's right. And I think the trial that will probably never be done, but it's always been kind of a question in our mind is, 
like the cardiac literature, do you bypass alteplase and then go straight to thrombectomy? I don't think the trial will ever be done because again, only about 15% of patients are thrombectomy candidates. Alteplase is a standard of care. And if you can get it infused in the 30 minutes that you're calling your team in for thrombectomy, why wouldn't you give the alteplase? Because at least you're doing something while you're calling the team That's in. That's exactly right. Yeah, and, so. and I think the you know, kind of pushing the envelope of this is like even the neuroprotectives that we're doing mm -hmm. now, you know, it's, it's, I think we have to, you know, it's always the old saying in medicine, first do no harm, right? And then let's figure out if something works or not. And if it, if we're not seeing any clear benefit, okay. But, um, you know, the, the thing that, that drives all of us nuts is, you know, thrombectomy is not new. This isn't cutting edge <laughs> treatment. This isn't, you know, it, it, it's, and, and I, I, you know, shout out to our industry partners, and I know our colleagues, and I'll, I'll take the hit for this, that, you know, I get beat up when I say this. I mean, a monkey can do it now. I mean, it, it's the technology is so good. Um, you know, the danger, I mean, there's judgment in who to do, and there's always judgment in any type of surgical procedure, but the technology and the stents and the suction of it are so good right now. We can get the triage process in place. We got to go beyond that of just sucking a clot out now, mm -hmm. and we have to start looking at injecting neuroprotectives to help those cells heal. Because the most frustrating thing in the world, right? You get this incredible result. Yeah. We've got calluses on the back of our hands because we're patting <laughs> ourselves on the back so much, and the patients don't really improve. You got a beautiful picture, and a lot yeah. of times these before and afters is like, I want to see the patient. You know, I want to see the patient doing this and speaking. And yeah. um, we've got to go beyond that and be able to bathe those cells with a neuroprotective. And the problem is that everybody focuses on well, what neuroprotective? Who, who cares? Put try. something up. Yeah. Try something. I think it goes back to what I said in the last talk is. We can get the vessel open 95% of the time, but that really only equates to the patient being functionally independent half of the time. So what do we do for the other half of patients? Because I can tell you that for most of them, the CT perfusions are indistinguishable. So I can't always tell who which 50% will get better and which 50% won't. So what's the difference maker? Maybe right. it is something like that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we don't know, but we have to push that to kind of sort that out. That's interesting too, because what you're saying is, you know, the ER people that want to believe that thrombectomy is the end all be all. So the trials are being done of IV alteplase versus thrombectomy. Now they're being done in Japan and China right. because here in the United States, you can't just do that. Right. Yeah. I don't and, think a lot um, happened in the U S the Japan trial showed that it was non-inferior, but they used a dose of alteplase 0.6 mg per kg which is not the dose that we use in the United States. The China tr trial did use 0.9 mg per kg. And again, you have to have that large vessel occlusion. So my problem with the trials is we just talked about that you need to have a door to needle time of 30 to 45 to 60 minutes. So if 80 to 85% of patients aren't gonna have that large vessel occlusion, and now it's like, oh, give them all to place. And we know that the faster you give somebody the alta place, the better the outcome. You're you're missing the boat now yeah. with the tried and true therapy. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's coming out of there. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, there's been so much false data. And let's yeah. be honest, we've had a lot of garbage data in this country. I mean, yeah, you know, totally. you want to get back to for two years, for two years, not that long ago, patients were dying and getting maimed because of really horrible studies that were done in New England Journal of Medicine, yeah. Lancet, um, you know, these trials, um, you know, basically were poorly run trials. They jumped to a conclusion and ever uh, IA doesn't work, thrombectomy doesn't work. Right. And, um, you know, it, it was terrible. I mean, it was a really rough time for, for interventionalists because we knew it. We saw every, every week we were saving somebody from, you know, their speech, moving uh, one side of their body. The outcomes we knew were better, but it was that Look horrible data. Trial. I mean, here's a trial where we already know that thrombectomy is superior to TPA alone in patients who present within, you know, six to eight hours. But anecdotally, we've been treating patients with symptoms for two or three days as long as they have penumbra on the CTP. And then here comes a trial where you randomize someone to an aspirin or a thrombectomy. Do you remember those conversations? Of course. I mean, we, yeah. Manny and I had these conversations when, when you know, the, the, the genesis of Dawn and, um, you know, nothing against the authors. I mean, we're, we're part of that. I think we enrolled the yeah. first patient. You know, we were like, this is going backwards. Like we give, we give dual antiquatelets. <laughs> so you're telling us to go less than the standard of care and just give, give aspirin. I'll never forget. We were yeah. like, okay, so if it's your mom and they're coming in with a stroke, 
you're going to give them just aspirin? You know, it's like, well, you know, with the data, I'm like, come on. I mean, the best saying out there is that uh, I forgot who said it, but, um, you know, it's like showing, doing a study to prove that parachutes work when your plane's going down. <laughs> I mean, we don't need to do that study. We, we, we know that, you know, we have common sense, but right. I want to go to some slides here. Um, so um, we're going to show some data that this is really early data and we're, we're, we're getting this uh, uh, together to kind of look at the big picture um, of the uh, uh, a neurologic emergency room. And um, is, so is that up on the screen now? So you can see what, um, you know, uh, this is just a, a, a chunk from uh, April to October, um, how many calls, um, you know, that, uh, that went to the command center is 174 calls, um, 27 transfers from um, GNI spoke to the hub. Um, and of those six patients were given IV uh, all to pay place. I and mean, you can read it as well as I can, four stayed um, at the spoke hospital, two transferred to mechanical thrombectomy. It's an important point. We do our model. We do not want to take patients unnecessarily from stroke hospitals. You know the the larger centers. Um, you know the goal there is just they don't want to deal with it. So it's just um, uh, you know send them, send them, send them. It's not good for the hospital. It's not good for the patient. You know a TIA or if it's not large vessel, our neurologists are boots on the ground at every one of these centers, and so we are really keeping these patients. And you can see on this slide. Um, you know, the, the reason for transfer. And it's not all just stroke. I mean, they're brain tumors, sinus thrombosis, intracerebral hemorrhages. And this is really, really early on. Um, and and I, I think, and you can speak to this better than anybody, I, I think it's just kind of doing this. Um, Absolutely. As, our, as a network grows, but also as a comfort level grows with the ER doctors. Yes. And uh, what, what's really neat is that the neuro ED is taking, you know, a significant amount of these calls, which is great because we talk about GNI totally being a team and not being in silos. And what happens is you know, just like you guys see us sitting here, this is what we do on an everyday basis. I remember when we were getting ready to roll this out and I met you guys before M&M and we carved out 30 minutes before M&M to say, there's a large vessel occlusion with a completed infarct. Does that come or stay? Right. Yeah. There's a seizure that doesn't need continuous EEG monitoring. Does that come or stay? Right. And then we went through TPA things like it's a sickle cell patient, it's a pregnant patient, it's right. an aphasic patient. Exactly. And uh, you know these things, there's so much work that goes into them so that when we roll them out, they're successful. And what we do is we take the call and then the next call is from me to one of you to say, hey, I do think this patient needs to come over. Are we looking ICU? Are we looking step down? Are we looking just the floor? Right. What kind of imaging should we do when they get here? And then if it's me or my team arranging that, you guys can focus on the ICU and your surgeries. And we're just working as a team, yeah. again, to do what's best for the patient because that's, right. that's what it's about. I think another thing that we've touched on it in a couple of different talks, but never went into any detail, <laughs> was finding those patients, selecting those who might be eligible to receive TPA in the nine hour window. Yeah. So you're, you might be getting a call about a stroke alert and um, it might not even be on the, the outside emergencies radar that this yeah. patient could get off the place. And you're saying, wait, wait, you know, okay, symptoms were six hours ago, the CAT scan's normal. Okay, let's bring them over. Get the CT perfusion. Maybe we maybe we can turn them into a candidate for Alta Place. Yeah, we have, and we've, we've done, done that, that at least once, and we've sent others over at least for the further evaluation. Yeah, but. yeah, and that's I mean, and that's a good point because you know this is something that this wouldn't work this way if we weren't all constantly together and discussing this. Cause you're right. There's all these, you know, you can't make protocols. You know, we always say it all the time. And it's like, a, it's one of the GNI mantras, you know, protocols make people stupid because you don't think out, you know, you don't think there's always some type of, um, you know, you have to use your brain and your human nature to say, okay, this is a gray area. So what's the best thing for the patient? You know, what do you do with a pregnant person? Where, where, where should they be? You know, there's some type of um, higher, you know, whatever that we need is this, should they be in the ICU? Should we come right to the ER where we can put a ventriculostomy because it's quicker? Um, and the other point that you bring up, which I don't know that, you know, to, which I think goes unmissed, our M&Ms or our morbidity, mortality, I mean, PI, there's all the new names for it. But the bottom line is when something doesn't go right, um, our team is at every M&M, our PAs, all the surgeons, all the neurologists, 
anesthesiology, ER medicine, and whoever else needs to be there if there's an issue so that we can talk about and say, hey, how can we do this better? How, how you know, what went wrong here? What can we do better? You know, whether it's a transfer issue, whether it's, um, you know, we should have gotten a film, whether, whatever it is. And um, that's how we constantly, you know, you get better. And I, I don't know any other m m that has that. I mean, they're usually a closed door thing with, and it's usually a surgical one where everyone's making up excuses that they didn't do anything yeah, wrong. Exactly. And I think the, what we also do is we bring in the comprehensive stroke measures into our um, PI or m m right. You know, we're looking at, you know, which TPA patients had a hemorrhagic conversion. Was it symptomatic or not symptomatic? What about the thrombectomy patients? How many of our um, post-thrombectomy patients went to nursing home versus rehab? I mean, we're acutely aware of all of these metrics. Right. So. And that's another great point is that, you know, we are primed to become the comprehensive stroke survey uh, center, excuse me. And uh, we've been, you know, preparing and it'll be uh, one of the only comprehensive stroke centers in that, in that area. Yeah. So we're actually just, you know, we're ready. We're just chomping yeah. at the bit to have the, to have the survey. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, we jokingly say that, you know, everybody, you know, wants to have a neuro ED and they probably should and, but they won't be what GNI is because of what you guys all just said about how we have that interdisciplinary model. I can guarantee you that I'm one of the only ER physicians across the country that has 10 different neurosurgeons in her phone, like one dial And away. we're the only neurosurgeons that have a, a consistent team of ER doctors that yeah. you know, know the protocols that we talk about and we, we, we do things you know, together and collaboratively. It really is, a, um, it's just a great model. And, and to that point that you brought up, um, you know, having this patients in these regions, I don't have to all keep going to the yeah. city. I mean, I'll say one thing and we have a couple of questions and I think this is a sad thing, not a positive thing. You know, when we first opened up the biplane in Chester County, mm -hmm. we treated the first yes. acute stroke with a thrombectomy in the history, in the history yeah. of Delaware County, that was 2017. Yes. That's a really sad thing. That shows you how dependent a lot of these regions are um, on sending patients to the city. And as we know, every minute, 2 million brain cells die. And by the way, I just want to clear that up. That's a completely made up number. So, I mean, it's, it's based it's on average. animal data. It's, it's yeah, it's, but it, the point is lots of brain cells we die. Like so it, Danielle, you got a question here? It looks like you got some good ones. Cause I see a gig one over there. Are you seeing COVID-19 patients complicated with stroke? Great question. Can I hit this one first? We're ready okay. For that. So my dear colleagues who I love to death, and I'm not going to say who or where, um, there was this, you know, when COVID first came out, nobody knew what to expect, right? And so all of a sudden, you know, a couple centers, um, one in New York was, oh, we saw a couple of young people with COVID. All of a sudden, it was a media blitz of, you know, there's a higher risk of, you know, and we, we were the first, uh, and again, I'm not, we just didn't see the data. Remember, we all sat down and I'm like, God, we looked, I think you pulled all our data. I did. And it just wasn't yeah. there. I and mean, we weren't seeing thing, it. What we were seeing was that the stroke patients weren't coming in, they were presenting late, they weren't candidates for any treatment. And we actually published that. That's exactly right. So, I mean, so the answer is no, but I think what we do know, which is common sense, is that if you're coming in with a stroke and you have COVID, your outcome's probably going to be worse, yes. right? I mean, because from, from lots of different reasons. Um, you know, we think we know the mechanism with the endothelium and the ACE, ACE but the answer is, I, I don't think so. So they said that not were the patients just having strokes. They said that they were having large vessel occlusion strokes in patients 50 and under. And actually, truth, we'll show you our phones in preparation for yeah. this session. I literally just texted these two because I have them in my phone. I literally just texted these two last week that yeah. something was just published yep. in Stroke that said it's there is no increased correlation between COVID-19 and stroke. However, if you do develop stroke with COVID, your mortality was worse. Right. Which is which is expected, and and it was, and I'm glad that that was done. I think it was actually Shermer and them out at Geisinger, which was great. It was a very important paper, yes. Because people then automatically went to the next step, and were recommending that if you have COVID, I, I can't tell you, you guys probably got it too. I had family members and friends call. Should I take aspirin? Yeah. You know, I, I got COVID. Should I take aspirin? Should I be on a blood thinner? Yeah, low so, knocks. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you can see where that slippery slope goes. Um, 
So what I think we'll do now is we have five minutes left and let's bring Natalie in here. And so we're gonna open up to questions for um, the entire day. Uh, we'll answer any questions. Come on, Natalie, yeah. come on in here. And while you guys are coming in, I would just say to, because this is um, mostly an ER talk, I would just say, you know, to all the ER providers that are out there who have been on the front lines for the past, what is it, eight months now? Because I do feel like the second wave is coming back. You know, thanks for all of your hard work. Keep up the good work. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, you know, special uh, round of applause for all of you guys out Absolutely. there. Because it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been easy. This has probably been the toughest year of my career where there are really some days that I wake up when I don't want to be an ER doctor. And I've never said that before. Yeah. And uh, just uh, going with all the camaraderie of GNI, I actually remember texting Dr. Vez one day to say, you know, they don't have gowns for me down in the ER. And he said, you know, we have them for you. Yeah. So. And that's, you know, everybody <laughs> chipping in and, and, but to that point, you know, EMS, um, and I see we're getting a lot through the chat room and, and things like that, you know, we're be part of us come, you know, you can reach out to us anytime. Um, the you know, head of our whole clinical operation actually is an EMS, Tom Kurtz, who's absolutely amazing. Um, and, and actually a PA, um, so, you know, we, we want, we need your input. We want to be able to figure out how to do these things better and better. So, um, and, and, you know, we often will, when, um, several times you can come and watch us do the interventions. Um, you know, you should come right up into the, the, the biplane room. Cause it's not, there's a back sterile, non-sterile room. Um, and we, we absolutely welcome that. So, um, any questions we will open up for the, for the remainder, uh, uh of the few, uh, we'll actually stay as long as there's questions, but uh, any questions at all from today, um, from the ICH talk, the physical exam talk, um, anything at all? Yeah. All right. We, we do have Danielle thoughts. Brown here if you had any questions about the uh, neurological assessment as well. Exactly, which I thought was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, that was a really great, uh, you can't do that in a typical conference yeah. style where you have a patient in and can zoom in on pupils yeah. and things like that. So Which they did. And please give comments, um, you know, go to the, the, sur the survey uh, uh, session and, you know, each year, I mean, who knows what the new normal is going to be, um, but I'm, we're starting to think even at a national level of keeping this type of format, even when we go back to live to do certain things where we yeah. can do. It's nice. It, it, it really works. And, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed this more than just listening to us drone on on PowerPoints one after another. And, uh, you know, we kind of said no pre-recording, but, you know, it's like safety. There's no safety net, as you all saw this morning. So I just want to thank God that I didn't start swearing or do anything bad when we were live and I didn't know we were live. So see, <laughs> it shows them yeah. that, it, you know, but uh Okay, so we will uh, end today's session. Um, the last session is a, um, uh, please go into the room and, and uh, um, you know, mingle with your colleagues. And again, I can't emphasize enough, you know, start talking to people, start talking to people from other hospitals, from other ERs, we're all in the same network, we're all in the same, even if you're not in this network, we want you in this network to, to kind of work with us and, and um, you know, be part of the team and be part of this ecosystem. Um, and uh, we will see you tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m. We got a great day tomorrow. Um, there's some incredible sessions. Um, and again, you know, don't be shy. Uh, we'll, we'll keep things provocative. So good night, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow. Night.